Charles Chairperson, this debate on the President's State of the Nation Address comes at a very, very difficult time for South Africa. Our thoughts and prayers are with every South African who is struggling to put food on the table today. Our prayers are also with those who have lost loved ones to the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as those battling the virus as we speak. May you find strength in the love and support of those closest to you. We are facing an uncertain and a potentially very bleak future. And we must acknowledge that in this House today. More than ever before, the words spoken in this House must be frank and they must be honest. Anyone who steps up to this podium to try and sugarcoat the, uh, the truth, who tries to downplay the challenges or shield the inept and the corrupt will be doing this country and our citizens a massive disservice. We would have any chance of digging ourselves out of the hole that we're in, then we have to be honest and truthful about the scale of our problems, the mistakes that contributed to putting us in this position, and importantly, the steps we must take to rectify them. That goes for members on both sides of the House. Whether you sit on my right or my left, our job is the same, to act in the best interests of every man, woman and child in this country, and to navigate our way out of this crisis. That is our sworn duty, and we'd better start doing this job for once. We owe it to the citizens who rely on us to make their democracy work. We owe it to those who've been through hell and are just looking to this house for some sense that things are going to be okay. And we owe it to the people who paid the ultimate price in the pandemic and the loved ones that they've left behind. At a time when our country is at its lowest and its people are filled with doubt and uncertainty, we cannot mess around in this House. Our duty, first and foremost, must be to hold the executive accountable. No rubber stamping, no grandstanding, no using numbers to shield people from accountability. Honourable members, last Thursday we gathered to listen to the President's State of the Nation and his plans about how we need to do things to get to where we need to be. And if we're honest, the mood going into the SONA was not hopeful at all. Having sat through previous sonas by President Ramaphosa and then watched as every grand plan and big announcement evaporated during the course of the year, even the most loyal commentators were now looking on the 2021 sona with a sense of realism. The once lustrous cloak of the new dawn of three years ago turned out to be a cheap imitation. Today it's frayed and faded and not even worth bringing out the closet anymore. After three years of the Ramaphosa administration and the COVID-19 and lockdown crisis, no one was going to succumb again to the Tumamina craze. The Kool-Aid remained untouched. And it turns out for very good reason, because aside from a few lines about COVID-19 and uh, vaccines, this sonar was more or less the same as the one from 2018, 2019 and 2020. The same burning issues are still right there at the top of the president's agenda. And if we just shut our eyes and cross our fingers, any day now we're going to see a turnaround at Eskom. Any day now we're going to see that we're appointing qualified, proper people into the public service. And any day now the ANC really, really, truly this time are going to be serious about stamping out corruption. These have all been promised at multiple sonas before, with very little evidence of progress. But the President wants you to know that they're still on top of his mind and top of his to-do list. The only problem is, people no longer believe it. And I'm not talking about just the members on the opposition benches, I'm talking about civil society, I'm talking about business, I'm talking about religious leaders, the press. There's a growing realization that this president and his government cannot or will not tackle the big issues of the day. Paralyzed by factionalism and power struggles, they're incapable of making even the obvious decisions like suspending people who are so clearly guilty of corruption, let alone the big decisions that we need to be able to breathe reform so that we can revive our economy. And it seems that this government is increasingly relegated to the role of spectators, gawking helplessly at the fire that is consuming our country instead of getting stuck in there and fixing the fire and putting out the flames. What many people thought was the best chance that the ANC had of a president who would be able to turn things around has turned out to be almost no chance at all. But what perhaps stood out most glaringly from the President's speech last Thursday was the doublespeak. 
the entire speech was full of massive contradictions between noble-sounding pledges and the reality of ANC government's actions. The president repeatedly spoke of reforms, but what is clear from his actions, or certainly the inaction, is that he means for things to just stay the same. If he couldn't get his own party to back the finance minister's reform plans last year, the chance of driving a meaningful reform plan this year seemed remote, but at least it sounded good in the speech. The president spoke of fixing the public service, as he did in last year's SONA. But what he really means is that he intends to continue with the ANC's state capture project through the policy of cater deployment. You cannot professionalize the state and deploy party loyalists into key government positions. It's one or the other. But it sounded good in the speech. The president spoke once again of job creation, and amen to that. He repeated for the first time the DA mantra that it's the private sector that is going to be able to create the bulk of these jobs. But while he says that, his government is doing all it can to discourage entrepreneurship, make it as hard as possible for small, medium, and micro enterprise businesses to survive. Thanks to the world's most unreliable power supply, a set of rigid labor laws designed around the largest players at the table, and a completely incompetent state bureaucracy, South Africa continues to drop down the ease of doing business index. But giving a nod to the private sector in the speech sounded good. The president spoke of strengthening our agricultural output, but in the very same breath, he reaffirmed his government's commitment to the expropriation of property without compensation. And if you're still unsure what this looks like, please take a look at the case of Mr. Ivan Klutti, a coloured farmer who's been leasing and successfully farming uh, a state farm in the Darling area for the past couple of years. Two weeks ago, he received notice of eviction and told that his farm was to be handed over to an MK veteran. That is straight out of the ZANU PF playbook. Expropriation without compensation is the very antithesis of strengthened agricultural output. It is a massive deterrent to investment, not only in agriculture, but in all sectors of our economy. Again, the contradiction doesn't seem to matter as long as it sounded good in the speech. The president spoke of drawing a line in the sand on corruption once and for all. Except it's not once and for all, because we heard it in 2018, 2019, and 2020. And in the intervening period, the worst form of state corruption, pandemic corruption, has been endemic across South Africa. Because corruption is endemic in the ANC. And the, there's little the president can do, because it's becoming clear that he does not hold any of the ACEs. So instead, we get promised some superfluous body, this, this time an anti-corruption advisory council, to create the illusion that we're doing something. We don't need another council or panel or agency. We need to bring back the scorpions with their 93% conviction rate, which is probably the reason they were banned in the first place. And the president still seems intent on rolling out the most ambitious vaccine program in the country, aiming to reach tens of millions of people before the end of the year. The reality, though, is that as things stand, we will not have anywhere near the vaccine doses needed to do so. Not because other countries hoarded vaccines, but because our government was fast asleep for half a year while they were getting in the queue. And so now we have to be satisfied with the scraps from around the world beaten to the post by even a failed state like Zimbabwe. On every single issue in the Sona speech this year, there was a gulf as wide as the Karoo sky between what was promised and what this government is either able or willing to deliver. Dressing up the top and the tail of the speech with great stories and flowery metaphors about fiery Feinbos renewal and inspirational poems by Maya Angelou failed to mask the shortcomings that were so very obvious in the body of the speech. Now, I've got no problem with using quotes and speeches. Some of you in the house may have noticed that uh, I tend to do it myself. But then the quote has to be appropriate. It has to sound credible in the context of the rest of the message. Imploring people in the wonderful words of Maya Angelou to rise to the face of our challenging future may sound incredible, but it means nothing when it is the government and actions and policies that are actually keeping people down. You cannot tell people to rise when it's government's unjust and irrational decisions these past 11 months that have destroyed their livelihoods and kept them pinned down. 
You cannot tell people to rise when even the reformers in the cabinet are unable to breathe life into these policies we need to be able to move things forward. You cannot tell people to rise when the factions of the own party have immobilized the state to such a degree that absolutely nothing gets done and the looters stay in their positions in government. People cannot rise with the boot of government on their neck. So that particular Maya Angelou quote used by the president was perhaps not the right quote for the occasion. Fortunately, I found a, something a little bit more appropriate, and it's a song by the Beatles, and some of you might recognize it. It starts like this. He's a real nowhere man, sitting in his nowhere land, making all his nowhere plans for nobody. Because that is essentially what last week's Sono's speech was all about. Plans so far removed from reality and from ever being executed by a permanently paralyzed government that they might as well have not been made at all. Nowhere plans for nobody. But here's the thing, Mr. President, wherever you may be, I know that you're in a terrible bind. And I know that the volatile situation in your party has left you with so little room to move. Even if you wanted to act, and I'm really willing to give you the benefit of the doubt that you do, the political sands are shifting under your feet every single day. The forces are amassing against you. And you only need to read the tea leaves to see that that is the truth. This means that the country is essentially trapped in a bus with no driver hurtling towards some cliff. The truth is we don't have time to wait for the ANC to sort out the internal infighting and for somebody to grab the wheel, even if that is possible. Our problems are so pressing and so big that we have to act right now. We don't have a moment to lose. And so today, I would like to propose to the president a way out, a way out where South Africans emerge as the winners. Over the next five months, the DA will table, bull by bull, an agenda for reform and growth here in the House. Each of these bills will deal with an issue critical to our economic recovery, spanning things like energy, public enterprises, finance, mining, labor, and small business. A few of them are existing bills that we will reintroduce, but most of them are new bills. And we're going to need your help, the reformers and the ANC, to pass them. We will soon be reintroducing our cheaper energy bill to break up Eskom into separate generation, transmission, and distribution entities, as well as allowing cities to procure energy directly. Then there's our fiscal responsibility bill, which is already tabled, which will ensure that we can keep our country's debt levels down and ensure that we can control how much government borrows every year. Also adding committee time is our public finance management amendment bill, which was tabled last year, and this will go a long way to ensuring greater transparency at our state-owned entities. Then in the mining sector, we'll table two private members' bill, one to rescind Section 100 of the MPRDA, the section that contains the investment-killing mining charter, and another bill calling for greater transparency around mining license issuing. To assist small businesses and make it easier for them to operate and reduce friction costs, we will reintroduce our red tape amendment bill, which is critical if we are serious about growing jobs in that sector. And finally, we'll be submitting significant amendments to the Labor Relations Act to prevent agreements reached at bargaining councils from being applied to businesses who weren't even party to those negotiations. Now, individually, each of these bills could have a meaningful impact on the way business is done and public funds are managed. But together, they have the potential to kickstart our economy and start a jobs revolution in our country. We'll be tabling not to make a political point, but to give the good men and women in this House and those still left in the ANC the opportunity to vote for reform when the enemies of growth around them won't. It's not even necessary for the whole ANC caucus to back the bills. The opposition stands together and we just need a third of the people on those benches and let's call it 85 members. Surely that's possible. And more importantly, surely it is morally right. There must be 85 good men and women in the ANC benches that want to do the right thing by South Africa. But the big issue here is urgency. We've got no time to lose. We can't afford another wasted year of dithering and ANC infighting. Nowhere man, don't worry. Take your time, don't hurry. Leave it all till somebody else lends you a hand. Mr. President,
We are here to lend you a hand so that you can do what's right for the country rather than what's right by your party. Now, it seems inconceivable that there should even be a question mark hanging over this. Surely a president recognizes that their constitutional duty is firstly to their country. But things are clearly not that clear cut in the ANC. The predecessor of President Ramaphosa famously said that for him it was ANC first, South Africa second. And the president himself is on record as having said that he'd rather be seen as a weak president than split the ANC. It's hard to imagine a leader in any other modern democracy in the world ever even uttering these words. Being a fan of Maya Angelou, as the president quoted, you'd probably know that she once said, and I quote, when someone shows you who they are, believe them the first time, unquote. Is that what the president was doing? when he told us that he placed ANC unity over that of the country? Was he showing us who he was? Should we have believed him? And I hope not, because that's the last thing the country needs. We're in a desperate situation on multiple fronts. We've never been more in need of bold and courageous leadership that puts the country first. We cannot afford anything less. And the president has to give us some sign that he is that man, because at the moment, it doesn't look like it. He couldn't bring himself to stand up for the Constitution and the rule of law when it was trampled all over by his own Secretary General and, her de and his deputy. His response when Jacob Zuma publicly vowed to defy constitutional court order before the Zondo Commission was, well, we should all give him some time and space. And his silence yesterday when President Zuma stuck to his word and snubbed the Commission spoke volumes. None of that sounds like somebody who's putting the country first. The time has now come to put courage first and to show that courage by making it clear that it is South Africa first for the president. If the president supports the agenda for reform and growth when we table our bills here in parliament, History will remember him as a president who stood up for his country even though it was hard to do so. If he fails to do so, history will record him as yet another ANC leader who buckled under the weight of his party's selfish goals. A president who couldn't find the courage to do what's right when it mattered most. And you know what? I don't even care if you don't want to back a DA bill. If you guys want to write them, rewrite them, submit them under your own names, hell, even if you want to turn them into committee bills, that's fine. Because it doesn't matter about the name on the bill. It matters that we deal with the things that fix our country. We fix the things that are holding our country back and impoverishing our people. But you must know that the alternative for you in all of this does not end well. If you fail to implement economic reforms, and if this then accelerates our slide toward a failed state that cannot fulfill its basic obligations, the people will abandon you. Mr. President, you opened your sonar with the imagery of a Feinbos felt being renewed every 20 years by a hot fire. That is a good analogy for our country, but perhaps not in the way that you thought. In your version, the fire is the COVID pandemic that will supposedly burn our felt clean and allow new seeds to sprout. But this is not true. We don't need a killer virus to level our economy and to force us to start from scratch. That is such a fundamentally, deeply cynical view. No, what is going to save us in South Africa is the blaze of renewal that comes from a new government. That is the hot fire that will allow the dormant seeds of our stalled economy to germinate and our country to explode into vivid color. Just as the Feinbos felt needs us to happen every couple of decades for it to thrive, so too as our country. So the choice is yours, Mr. President. You can either help reform the economy now, or you can take your chances with the fire that will undoubtedly 
follow. Thank you.